Because they fly, birds, bats, and insects need to control their altitude. This is something that we, as humans that walk on the ground, don't have much experience with. So, how do they do it? What sensory information is used, and how is it processed? These are the questions we addressed in our paper, Visual Control of Altitude in Flying Drosophila, published in Current Biology. A recent model for altitude control in insects proposes that they control height above ground based on the speed of motion underneath them, making use of the following geometric relationship. The speed of visual motion underneath an observer, called the ventral angular velocity and measured in radians per second, is equal to forward speed in meters per second divided by altitude in meters. Here we illustrate what this relationship means. For an insect flying half a meter above ground, motion on the downward facing part of the retina will be twice that of an insect one meter above ground. The Ventral Optic Flow Regulator model by Franceschini, Rouffier, and Serre proposes that insects have a preferred speed of ventral motion, so that if they experience motion that is too fast, they ascend and thus slow it. Insufficient ventral motion will likewise cause descent and restore the preferred speed. So, the altitude at which an insect flies is set to that at which ventral visual motion causes no change in altitude. This model makes predictions that we tested. Plotting climb rate against ventral angular velocity, the point at which climb rate reaches zero under this model is defined to be the preferred ventral angular velocity. Disturbances reducing the visual speed below this preferred value cause descent, and increases in visual speed will cause ascent. If we extend the range of ventral motion from front to back and include back to front motion, the predictions of the model for a range of ventral speeds is drawn in red. This model predicts that the amount of lift produced by an insect should change in the way shown as a function of ventral angular velocity. We tested the predictions of this model on the fruit fly Drosophila. The critical feature of our apparatus is that we could artificially subtract the effect of the fly's own motion from its visual input. This dynamic clamp allowed us to deliver the desired stimulus despite any potential compensation by the ventral optic flow regulator or any other control law that might be used by the fly. Flies were released into our arena and filmed from above using five cameras. Custom software tracked the flies and provided position information with 40 millisecond latency. This information was used to update projectors showing patterns on the walls and floor of the arena. In the following movies showing fly location within the arena and visual stimuli projected on it, flies are shown circled in green and their altitude is illustrated with a green line extending from the floor of the arena. Visual stimuli, such as the sinusoidal grating shown here, were visible to the fly, while illumination for tracking was in the near infrared and thus invisible to the fly. In the first video, when the fly crosses the midpoint of the arena, our software automatically initiates the dynamic clamp, keeping ventral angular velocity fixed at zero while simultaneously maintaining a constant spatial wavelength when viewed from the fly's position. In this instance, the fly did not noticeably descend, despite the sudden drop in ventral angular velocity. The data from many trials show that flies do not change altitude when held to a range of ventral angular velocities from negative 100 to 100 degrees per second. These results are contrary to the predictions of the ventral optic flow regulator model and suggest that flies may use other strategies to regulate altitude. Something we noticed is that flies often flew at the height of nearby edges. We designed an experiment in which the arena walls showed a static contrast edge and recorded their trajectories as they passed the mid-arena point. As shown here, with time series in black and histograms in red, many flies flew at the height of a dark over light contrast edge. The red histogram is plotted again for clarity, and repeating this experiment with a light over dark edge resulted in a similar distribution, as shown in the gray histogram. Shifting the height of the edge shifted the location of the peak in the distribution. These results suggested that nearby edges in the environment might be an important cue that flies use to set their altitude. To compare the relative importance of the edge tracking reflex to the response predicted by the ventral optic flow regulator, we performed a set of experiments that placed the two algorithms in direct conflict. The test was performed by quickly raising or lowering the height of a horizontal edge that a fly was tracking, while simultaneously displaying high contrast sinusoidal gratings on the arena floor. One possibility is that flies may follow the edge to its new height, suggesting that this edge tracking response is dominant. Alternatively, if the flies regulated lift solely according to a ventral optic flow regulator model, they should have ignored the lateral stimulus and remained at the same altitude because the visual pattern beneath them did not change. This example shows what we found to be typical. Flies follow the height of the edge, showing that the edge tracking is sufficient to elicit altitude responses in flies. Furthermore, the relative importance of the ventral optic flow on altitude regulation is low. 
To our knowledge, this is the first experimental evidence that freely flying animals adjust their altitude to the height of nearby visual features. Our paper also quantifies other altitude responses, such as a wide field compensatory response and an expansion avoidance response. Together, our results show a remarkable correspondence between the sensory motor algorithms used to regulate motion in the horizontal and vertical domains.